All right, so I think today that I ought to uh, review what we did last time. Um, in part because I skipped a couple of steps. And um, in fact, I think Weinberg also slept over something. So let me. Do this again. Is there, are there any questions though, before we start? Um, are you going to post solutions for the previous homework assignment? Yeah, I am. <coughs> I just didn't get around to it. Don't do it yet. Huh? <laughs> oh, or wait, because some people haven't turned it in. <laughs> <laughs> well, do, do you. Just no, no, you could, you could post. It's almost done. What is the. What um, is the in any case, they certainly not yet. Um, okay, a couple of things. I, I might as well do it the way I did in the notes. I've redone the notes. So now the, the notes contain a fairly complete description of what I did last month. The, the online Which notes chapter? are latex. Which chapter is this? It's still chapter 17. I had the misguided inspiration that I put the QED as an example. And that's rather a chunky example. Um, let me first back up though to something that uh, you can imagine. Um, suppose we went through, in fact, in a sense we already have that, we have an expression which is 17.126 um, this, this equation has vacuum time order product let me just call the phi 1 from phi n as a ratio of integral 0 phi double prime phi 1 through phi n EVI s of phi of course phi prime 0 so we've been deriving all these expressions for the vacuum expectation value of time ordered products of fields because this is what appears in propagators. Um, well, it's because what we're doing here, you see, if you if you have here these at different space time points, then they're really separated by e to the minus i h, the time interval between the points. Okay? And it's, it's that succession of time intervals that gives us, in other words, it's the path integral representation of e to the minus i t h that gives us um, the path integral, right? That's what gives us the action up here. And so, um, so that's why we've got this. Then we had big factors of e to the minus i, essentially infinity h here. Um, and they turned out to be an e to the minus 2e0, essentially. And that's what gave us the denominator, basically. Now, but I mean, this left-hand side is also the expression we had when we were trying to compute or what the, it's the thing we needed to compute S matrix amplitudes. That is, it was, it was involved with the propagator. Well, for, yeah, for S matrix amplitudes, what you want is, e, is the time order, the, the, the mean value e to the I -H, between yeah. some, or well, the matrix elements of e to the time order product of e to the minus i, the interaction Hamiltonian d fourth x. And so that's why this is useful. But now this expression is actually true for an interacting theory with zero being the ground state. And what we did a couple of times ago is we said, well, for the case in which we're dealing with the free theory, then we can actually compute what these are. And they gave the i epsilon terms. Well, it's universally believed that if 
that the effect of these terms in the interacting theory is just to supply i epsilon terms. So that's eminently plausible. Anyway, um, so what I'm going to do now is uh, assume that. So in other words, the effect is that if we imagine that to be the physical vacuum, then we can get rid of these terms. And now we just have to remember that there are i epsilon terms in there. Okay. Equivalently, we could just be still doing perturbation theory and we have the, the free vacuum that we do understand and um, just be doing free QED. Okay. I don't know which is better. It's probably better to see both. Okay, so. So let me review what happened um, last time. I think we skipped a couple of steps there. So the, the Hamiltonian here is matter plus an integral of a half pi squared plus a half curl A squared minus A dot, dot J D cubed X plus V Coulomb, and V Coulomb, of course, is this thing that's a half integral J0 of X, J0 of Y, D cube X, D cube Y, 4 pi, X minus Y. All right. Now, and we've got del dot A, del dot pi equals 0. All right. So, what we want to do, now, this was for a free scalar theory. The analog thing for the, uh, for QED would be this. Uh, all right, let me write this. Write E to the I S C delta of del dot A D A psi, psi matter there, and um, integral e to the i s c. I'm going to just start here. Okay, so this is uh, our expression. I switched, I, I didn't use a's here or psi's because I want things that are gauge invariant here. So O's are gauge invariant operators. Example of gauge invariant operators are F mu nu, psi depth bar psi, and so forth. But not A mu and not psi itself. And over here when I write these, right, the, 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 the idea is that these guys are also gauge invariant. The reason this one is gauge invariant is going to have a d psi, d psi bar. So the e v i q lambda cancels. This is only, <coughs> f mu nu is only gauge invariant for u1 gauge series? That's right, that's right, okay. good point. If uh, we're dealing with um, a non-abelian gauge theory, then uh, if you want something gauge invariant, you, you trace over it like that. So, okay, so what we do then is we multiply top and bottom by f, where f is a factor, it's just integral e to the i over 2 integral grad a0 minus grad of triangle inverse. <laughs> J0 squared e4 of x d a0. And triangle inverse is the inverse of triangle, triangle meaning uh, grad squared. And it's 
In other words, triangle inverse is essentially uh, uh, an integral of 1 over 4 pi x minus 1. I think I ought to assign something related to that as a homework problem, um, just so that you get, get that straight. Um, now, this f, um, when we expand this, um, what happens is uh, we get e to the i uh, integral a half rad a zero uh, squared minus a zero j zero. In fact, I should write this. I shouldn't skip, I think I skipped these steps in class last time. If I can erase this yellow way in here. Um, this is then minus, the half cancels, minus rad A0 dotted into grad triangle inverse J0. And then uh, the next one is, um, uh, plus a half, uh, grad triangle inverse J0 dotted into grad triangle inverse J0. And all that d fourth x dA0. So if we now integrate by parts this gradient term, this gives us plus grad squared, and we just have a zero. And grad squared on inverse grad squared, that's just one. Anybody have a question? Anybody missing a candy? Okay. So this thing then is integral e to the i a half grad a zero squared uh, plus simply a zero j zero. And then we integrate this one uh, by parts. And we get a grad squared. So in other words, we have Laplacian inverse grad squared, which is of course Laplace, uh, Laplacian, Laplacian inverse j0. These guys cancel and give one. And then we integrate this by parts. And um, what we have then is all together uh, minus a half j0, Laplacian inverse j0, before that da0. So that's what that turns out to be. Now this term here combines with the a dot j to give us something that's nice and relativistic. And so this, this, this. So when we integrate by parts, the other terms disappear because we demand the fields fall off infinity or? When you integrate by parts, generally there's two terms, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. The other terms, yeah, the surface term, we're blowing away. Okay. Um, and frankly, I'm always worried about that, but I completely ignore these two. I mean, sometimes I get religion and worry about that. Most of the time I just blow it. And, to, um, when working these notes out, I had too many other things to worry about. I just blew away all the surface terms like nobody's business. But I think um, that that can all be justified. Anyway, so time ordered product of this product of gauge invariant operators, O1 through ON, in the physical vacuum, then is this ratio. And what we've got then is O1 through ON. We have now an e to the i s. We still have the Coulomb gauge constraint. We're, 
we're now integrating, indeed, this typo here, we're now integrating over all four, all four uh, gauge fields because we just brought in this thing as a trick. Now, what happens is this term cancels the Coulomb term. Saw last time. Um, this term combines with the other term, and so uh, to give us the following action at this stage, what we've got is an integral a dot squared times a half minus curl of a. This is the p squared term. Then we have plus a dot j minus a zero j zero. And then plus a half grad a zero squared, and then the metal drawn in four x. Now we've still got this Coulomb gauge condition, so we can toss in just for laps the term minus a dot dot grad a zero. And then we combine this term with this term with that term. And that gives us an integral of 1 half a dot minus rad a 0 squared minus a half curl a squared. And then this is um, j mu a mu in Weinberg's metric. And then we have plus ln in 4x. Anyway, whichever way you do it, whichever metric the thing works out. This is, of course, e squared minus b squared. So this is an integral of minus a quarter f mu nu, f mu nu minus, well, I seem to have my pluses and minuses screwed up. Um, let me just go with this. I, I, this may have plus, plus. Well, I'll put plus or minus because I'm not sure at this point. The sign of this term is whatever it is. And um, I, uh, I may have missed the sign. So let's just leave that on the side. Okay, so the point is what we've got here is with these operators, these functions are gauge invariant. This is gauge invariant because this is the gauge invariant action. Uh, the, the measure here, dA, since we're integrating over all four of them, it's gauge invariant. Here we have psi bar and psi, so that's gauge invariant. So everything's gauge invariant except for this cool old gauge fixing. Oh, why do we have side bar and side? Oh, uh, great question. We haven't yet into, we haven't yet shown, uh, worked out how to path integrate over fermions, mm -hmm. but that will turn out to be why we have side bar side. Um, it's also true, um, for example, if we had a charge scalar field, we'd wind up integrating. This is the real field, so we integrate over psi. It has two components. We have to integrate over both components. That's equivalent to integrating over psi bar psi. All right. So now, even though we've got gauge fixing going on, we now make a gauge transformation. And remember, the marvelous thing about this gauge transformation is that it is that this function lambda can, gets to depend upon x. Okay. Well, just as you can have integral minus infinity to plus infinity f of x dx equal integral minus infinity to plus infinity f of y dy, so too, 
if you just enumerate or denominate or replace all the fields by their gauge transforms, nothing happens. And so you can say um, that omega time order O1 through ON is omega time order O1 through ON prime. And of course, the prime doesn't have any effect here because everything's gauge invariant. These are explicitly gauge invariant operators. But what I meant by that prime is that this is a ratio, and in the ratio, I replace all the fields by their gauge invariant counterparts. Okay. But that means that this is equal to an integral O1, ON, e to the i s delta of del dot A plus Laplacian lambda dA d psi integral no O's in the denominator, sorry. E to the I S L dot A plus plus in lambda D A D side. Okay. Now, as I said last time, we have two trick two choices. We can make two tricks. One is that we just integrate over all lambda in the numerator and in the denominator. And what happens? This thing goes away. There might be some overall factor, but it'll be the same in the numerator and the denominator. And so what we get is O1 through ON e to the i s dA d psi over integral e to the i s dA d psi. So this is then this Everything here now is gauge invariant. We're integrating over all gauge fields and matter fields and all gauges. And uh, you might say, well, there are extra factors of infinity, but of course they cancel in this ratio. And in any case, with the path integral, we had extra factors of zero and infinity flying all around, i to the infinity or something. So you know, who cares? So this is a so we didn't, we didn't use up the integration of A to get rid of the delta function? We integrated over lambda. Okay, okay. Right. So I should I should indicate this explicitly. <coughs> and that gives us this. Okay, that's one thing we can do. The other thing we can do is instead of just integrating over lambda, we can multiply numerator and denominator by a certain function of lambda, and then integrate over lambda. And um, we're going to do that now. And in fact, what we're going to do then is we're going to say, so this goes up to here. This is going to be then equal to an integral O1 through ON, e to the i s, and we're going to multiply by e to the minus i alpha over 2 integral a dot e0 dot minus Laplacian lambda squared e fourth x. And let me keep everything here. Delta of del dot A plus the plus in lambda here, DA D psi D lambda. And the denominator of that we have integral E D I S E to minus I alpha integral. This same thing squared D four X delta term DA. Well, um, the integration over lambda just um, replaces Laplacian of lambda up here 
with uh, minus divergence of A, and that means that we have a new term added to the action. That is to say, now the action turns into an action S sub alpha, which is an integral minus quarter F mu nu, F mu nu minus alpha over two D mu A mu squared minus A mu J mu plus ln D4. So this then becomes integral O1 through ON e to the IS so alpha dA D psi over integral e to the IS alpha dA D psi. This A mu J mu coupling is, is Asian variant? No! Great observation. We're fi this is called a gauge fixing term. Right, this is a gauge fixing term. So what we've done is broken gauge invariance in order to um, how shall I say? We're in effectively in a particular gauge now. So which we gauge made the same gauge transformation, right? We, um, we integrated over all gauges. We integrated over all gauges, but with this thing which we're calling a gauge fixing term. So this breaks gauge invariance and uh, does it in such a way that this will give us the nice propagator. And um, so let me go through that now. I've also put the notes. So in other words, as I said, I've latex what I just showed you on the board. This is latex and it's in chapter 17, page 550. I've also added four pages to the notes on QED. The first four pages of these application to QED notes, though, are superseded by what's in the in the online in the book. Find nice propagator using the Coulomb what the metric what, what, what? Right. Okay, let me, 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 so let me go to um, let me go to this uh, point, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep just these two terms, um, and maybe I'll keep this one with a with a with a C number external current because I want to derive the propagator the way the way we did last time or the time before last with the, with the scale. Of, you know. So. Let's look at this S alpha, but the free part of S alpha, or alpha equal to 1. So I'm going to call that S01. And this is going to be an integral minus a quarter F mu nu, F mu nu, minus a half D mu, A mu, squared D4 of X. So in other words, I've said alpha equal to 1. Weinberger, of course, keeps alpha, but he's one. And I, I don't see any point in keeping the alpha. All right. So let's uh, let's expand this then. This is minus a quarter. And this is going to be d mu a nu minus d nu. In fact, this is these damn Greek letters, I think, are I, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get rid of the Greek letters here. I think they just make us confused. And moreover, mu and nu don't look all that different, especially in my handwriting. <laughs> and the result was that 
As I was looking at this, I couldn't tell which was mu and which was nu, and I had to redo it. So let's write, let's say this is da a, B, because A and B are not good choices either. Let's try C and D. Uh, B and C. D, B, A, C minus D, C, A, B times D, B, A, C minus D, C, A, B and then minus a half D oh, what do I call it? Um, let me just go with the D, B, A, B squared. Okay, so this is the expression that we've got. Now, if you just multiply that out, what you have is S01 then is um, integral minus a quarter, and now I'm going to multiply this out and we have something that's db a c times this one, which is db a c. And then I'm going to do these two together. So that's plus dc a b dc a b. And then we've got the cross terms, and they will be minus dc a b db a c, whoops, minus db a c c a b. All right, I think that's right. And then this term, on the other hand, gives us two terms. It gives us plus two, and let me call it db, ab, dc, ac. Okay. All right. Now, this works out very nicely, you see, because, first of all, this is the same as that if you just interchange b and c. These are dumbing variables, so they don't care what we do. Moreover, this one is the same as that one. But the key point is that this term cancels this term, these terms. And uh, to see that, of course, what you do is you integrate by parts. So, um, in other words, you can say that this thing is the same thing as plus 2 dc ab db ac. Wait a second, I, I did that incorrectly because I actually want. Let me get this right. Stick that step in the notes. So I'll make it straight. Yeah, no, this is right. Okay. And now if we compare this thing here, now let's just uh, raise one B and lower the other B. So this is just. Okay. If we now compare this with this, we see it cancels. So I'm not clear on the integration by part step. Well, you, you just take the B and shove it over here. You take the C and shove it over there. You blow away the surface term. Because okay. you've got too many other things to worry about. More equivalently, during this Great Recession, uh, Congress is not going to fund uh, creation of fund fields out of the so we have to know that. All right, so the result is that this term cancels these two. These two are the same, and altogether this S01 then is integral minus a half dA dB dB. Let me get this straight. Right. Okay. 
So that's what we have. And um, you can see then where the propagate is going to come from, because if you again integrate by pods, you have AB, AB separated by DA, by a Laplacian, a four dimensional Laplacian. And uh, that is equivalently going to be P squared. And so the, the propagator is just effectively P squared, or one over P squared. But in order to um, see that, and also to review how it was that we did the propagator before, I'm going to actually um, uh, go through the Fourier transform business. In other words, uh, I'm going to write this as minus a half integral d fourth x, d fourth p, d fourth q, 2 pi to the eighth, and this is going to be dA e to the i p x a b of p d a e to the i q x a b of q. Okay, so I've expressed two in both in the terms of the four-dimensional Fourier transform. Any questions? All right, well, you can see what this is going to boil down to. Um, these derivatives, a derivative with a lower a means we're differentiating with respect to x upper a, that pulls down an i p lower a. So this is minus a half integral d of x. Before, yes, there was a. Why don't we have positive and negative frequency terms? Right. Well, you can just all you can just say a b of x equals integral d four p over two pi to the fourth of e b i p x a b of p. That's all I'm doing, and so that happens twice. Good question, though. So you're going to snigger last time, so this time it'll be a crunch. All right, so what do we get here? We get I, P, A, I, Q, A, but upper A, E to the I, P plus Q, X, A nu P, whoops, that's my notes, damn it. A sub, how did I switch to A and B? I decided I was going to use B and C's. Well, Shall we stay with A and B? Yes. All right. So that's what we've got. The d fourth x over. Well, let's just do it in slow motion. This is d fourth p d fourth q over two pi to the fourth. Now we use up a two pi to the fourth. We integrate. Else. Fields should both have both have a B, right? Fields are being subject. Brilliant. That's what I've got in my notes, but of course I was switching from uh, my notes to Greek to Latin and then posing problems. Alright, so this then gives us delta core of P plus Q. Then we have um, I P A I Q A, and then uh, A B of P A B of Q. And this then tells us that Q is minus P, but that minus sign is canceled by the two I's. So we still have minus a half integral p fourth p over two pi to the fourth. 
Uh, we have p squared, and then we have a b of p, a b of minus p. So this is the sort of the, the minus p is the thing you would need to know. Equivalently, uh, we can write this since since a is a real function. Its Fourier transform of minus is just a star there, so we can also write that as minus a half integral d fourth p two pi to the fourth p squared a b of p a b star of p. So that's another way of writing it. All right. And let me just do the following. Let me just pull out the p squared and put it at the end here. And I'm writing minus i epsilon because those boundary terms gave us minus i epsilon. If we do this as just, if we're just doing straight perturbation theory and omega is the ground state of the free theory, then we can derive the i epsilons in a more or less legitimate way, the way we did before. And, you know, frankly, the only thing anybody knows is perturbation theory in a certain sense. By the way, let me just mention something sort of went by this perhaps a little too fast. This case where we express the time ordered product of gauge invariant operators in the vacuum as this ratio, no gauge fixing. Had we instead been doing these as Euclidean operators, then we'd have this minus the energy essentially here and minus the energy essentially there, integrating over all gauge fields. That's what one, that's the starting point for lattice gauge theory. And our, and, and one of the things Wilson <coughs> emphasized in one of his papers was don't fix the gauge. And what he meant was do that. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna add a J term to this. So we're going to have S10 of uh, epsilon j is then S10 of epsilon. This is the one with epsilon plus integral j mu a mu. Going to Greek again, d4 x. Okay. Now this though is a C number current. And um, as before, we're going to use this to drive the propagator. For yeah. That. So how does it work? That because I mean, this this one does not have a. I mean, it has the fermion conserved current. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was, I, I may have been just gilding the lily here. I mean, I, I probably should have done this just for the free theory, just to stay in perturbation theory. You want another? All right, so this is minus a half, and so I'm sort of leaning on what we did before, so I'm not putting in every step. So what we've got, in fact, I'm going to lapse into Greek again because the notes are in Greek. So that's the uh, minus i epsilon terms. And this j mu a mu does the same thing as before. So that's, that's what it does. It kicks in two terms. Two because there's a one here and a one, and this thing had a one half in it. And so, that's what uh, we've got. And then the next thing is we just say A prime mu is A mu minus J mu over P squared minus I epsilon. And when you do that, you see that S01 is minus a half integral A prime of P mu mu of p star p squared minus i epsilon minus j mu j mu over p squared minus i epsilon equals p i 
So this effectively is S10 of epsilon, epsilon j, plus a half integral j star mu of p, g mu nu, j nu of p, over p squared minus i epsilon, p four p, two minus four. So you see the propagated taking shape. And now the next thing is we define z of j as, and in fact, I'm going to lapse into free, the, the free theory here, e to the i integral j mu, a mu, d4 x. So as before, that's just going to be the, uh, That's just going to turn out to be um, e to the i over 2 integral j mu star p j mu p over p squared minus i epsilon like lapse back to that. Um, actually, no, I'm, I'm, I might as well follow the notes. Let me just follow the notes. J mu, j mu nu. <coughs> D4 P over T prime. Okay, so effectively the, 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 the path integral over the A fields cancels in the numerator and the denominator. We just get this phase, this phase factor. And um, we can now invert, well, of course, we never wrote explicitly what the JU of x in terms of j mu of p, but if we invert what we didn't write explicitly and express this, then uh, what we've got is the z of j, which is vacuum time order product e to the i integral j mu a mu equals x. Actually, this is then uh, e to the i over 2 integral d4 p over 2 pi to the 4, d4 x, d4 y, e to the minus i p x, e to the i p y, and I got j mu of x, j mu of y, flat space metric, but um, it's, it's traditional to, I mean, if you're not, you know, I mean, you can see I'm not spinning, all right? So you know <laughs> that it's very unlikely that it's really G mu nu of G R. Um, but uh, it's common to use G and A for flat space metric. Also, I think that's that's what um, Weinberg uses eta, but Heston Schroeder used G. All right. Well, we can rewrite this as e to the i over two integral d four of x d four of y j mu of x j mu of y delta mu nu of x minus y, where delta mu nu of x minus y is an integral p fourth p over 2 pi to the fourth, p e to the minus i p, x minus y over now p squared minus i epsilon. And now, just as before, that has a metric. Three. That has the metric in it as well. Duh, thank you. I'm going to use eta mu nu this time. Um, thank you. 
One of the can for sure. So now let's look at it. Let's just use, remember the tricks that we use. See, that's where this three, especially with my handwriting. Crazy. But anyway. So what is this? Just as for the scale of field, it's going to be 1 over i squared. The second variational derivative with respect to j of x and j of y of z of j is j equals 0. And this is just minus i delta mu nu of x minus y. And that is an integral e to of p to pi to the 4 e to the minus sign p x minus y minus i a to the mu over p squared minus i so on. Okay, so that's that's what um, that's basically the full, I think, derivation of, uh, of the standard propagator in, the, in, in QED. All right. So um, I've got, let's see, for the, I never did in class the simple path integral of the simple harmonic oscillator. In real time, I did it in I did it in, uh, in, in imaginary time, right? I remember you doing the free particle for both. I don't remember that. Like, uh, maybe I'm just not remembering it. Okay. Well, I did do the, I I think I did in class the harmonic oscillator in so to speak Euclidean space. If you want, I'll do, uh, I have sort of two different possibilities of what to do today. I could do the harmonic oscillator in real time, or I could um, start fermionic path intervals. Uh, the harmonic oscillator in real time is latex, so you can just read it if you want. Um, so let's, can we get a show of hands? You want to see the simple harmonic oscillator or you want to stop the fermionic path intervals? Fermionic path intervals. Do we have a second? All right. Okay. But if we, if we expand in the power series this thing, this is going to be f of 0 plus theta f prime of 0 plus theta squared f double prime of 0. And you see this one terminates. This is 0. So the most general function is c plus theta d, which c and d are complex. So what happens is in if for functions of a Grassmann variable, the number of functions is just out of 1, not out of 2. 
In other words, it's like the number of real numbers. I don't know why I'm going through this hell of stuff. All right. So there's there's countably infinite, uncountably infinite, and then functions of the set of uncountably infinite? Is that the idea? Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, we want to figure out what f of theta is. Well, since the total library of functions is just c plus theta d, oh gosh, let me write it a plus <laughs> theta d. So this is just a integral d theta plus b, I'm assuming b is complex from the Grassmann, so it's b integral theta d theta. So our whole integral table, the only reason people like fermionic path integration, our whole integral table for a single variable just figure, it just involves two integrals. And uh, so it's going to be a number. What is this number and what is that number? So it's just two numbers. All right. What we want is we want this to be the same as the integral of f of theta plus theta prime d theta, because we want to be able to shift theta. If you want, you can imagine this is going from minus infinity to plus infinity, but for a variable whose square is zero, it seems a little bit grandiose to call the integral going from minus infinity to plus infinity. All right, so what is this? This is A plus theta plus theta prime theta. No, 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 no. Theta plus theta prime B D theta. And we know this is going to be A integral. Whoops. It's going to be A plus theta prime b yeah. integral d theta plus b integral theta d theta. Right. Now, we want this to equal this, because we want to be able to shift. So why do we want to be able to shift? I don't understand. Well, because what, 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 what we can all be, we want to be in with, with ordinary variables, we have f of x plus a dx equals integral f of x dx. Okay. That's what we want to be able to do. And so that tells us then that we get to shift if we define this term to be 0 and this term to be 1. So what we have then is integral d theta is 0. Integral theta d theta is 1. Then this term is 0. This term is 0. And both of them give b b, and so this is equal to b, that's equal to b, so there we are. So now our integral table is integral a plus b theta d theta equals b. All right, so those are the, uh, that's basically integration. And now the, 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 the next things are, well, let's, let's see what else we can do with this. In particular, let's stay with a single variable and introduce a Fermi variable so that this is uh, 1, by which I mean psi, psi, dagger plus psi dagger psi is 1, psi squared, psi dagger squared is 
is zero. Now, we're going to let zero, which is going to be sort of our empty state, be defined as psi on any old state. I don't know why I called it G. Maybe I should call it B. But in any case, it's, uh, it's uh, any state. But once we pick that state, we leave it that state. We don't, we're not going to fool around with it have a different state. All right. Now let's see what sense this makes. What is psi on 0? Well, it's psi squared on g, that's 0. So we pick this so that it's annihilated by psi. So why couldn't we have just made that the thing we start with? That is, why do we have to introduce this G, G state? Well, I wanted to I wanted to make zero explicitly annihilated by psi. And you're right, we could have just said so you wanted to use the grass. I, wa I, wa I wanted I wanted to show well, no, more generally I mean, how do we know there's a state that psi annihilates? Mm -hmm. okay, maybe there isn't. But in fact, there is, because take any state, hit it with psi, that's a state that this annihilates. And surely psi doesn't annihilate every state. And what we're thinking of is, if since we're only in one Fermi degree of freedom, psi lowers fermion number, Psi dagger raises fermion number. Uh, the fermion number here is zero. You lower it, you're out of the game. Because you can't have fermion number minus one. Okay. Now we're going to define something, a state called theta, which is going to be one plus psi dagger theta on zero state. Now let's see what happened when psi hits theta. Well this is going to be psi on 1 plus psi dagger theta 0. Well that's psi 0 plus psi psi dagger theta 0. Well psi 0 is And psi psi dagger, well, psi psi dagger is 1 minus psi dagger psi theta 0. And so psi dagger psi, this theta is just a number. It's an anti-commuting number. If we brought it through, it would anti -commute. we'd say it would anti-commute twice. We're going to assume. Is, this is just a number. But it's an anti-commuting number. And psi is an anti-commuting So this thing is theta times 1 minus psi dagger psi 0. Okay. So what is psi dagger psi on 0? So this is just theta times zero. Okay, but let's um, go a step further. What is theta on theta? Well, the state theta is here, so this is theta times 1 plus psi dagger theta 0. Okay. So this is certainly theta 0 plus theta psi dagger theta 0. And 
what do you think this is? Yes, it's zero because you can anti-commute the theta with the side dagger. Then you get theta squared, and that's zero. So this is equal to theta zero minus side dagger theta squared zero, which is just theta zero. Okay. So now we have something cute here. We have. In fact, let me just grab this. Well, we have the sine theta is the same thing as theta theta. And theta theta theta. And this, in fact, is equal to theta on zero. So that's what theta theta has to be. But the thing that I want to, to stress with you is that we now have something. We now have this. We now have eigen vectors of the Fermi operator. Like. How do we decide that theta anti-commutes with psi? Well, just because we wanted it. It's 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 I mean what, what we're doing when we set this up, let, let's put it let me put it this way. Um, the deal is that we're setting up, we're bringing in theta, and we're going to use theta as a mathematical device in order to perform various calculations. So we can give it whatever properties we want as long as they're consistent and in fact as long as when we're done the final answer has no theta. Okay. So in other words what we're going to be doing is we'll have expressions with lots of thetas and, and so forth but when we're done we get a cross-section and it better not have any thetas in it. Okay. So, so then the question is, how do we know this is consistent? Well, it's pretty clear that it's consistent. You know, and it, it, this just it makes things convenient. So it's, a, it's an arbitrary definition, which um, I should prove to be consistent. Instead, I'm just going to say it's consistent. All right, now. A few more steps, and then I think we'll, we'll have enough of this for today. Um, one thing is we can go from theta to several thetas, so we have a subscript theta m, and then we would say, well, the anti-commutator theta m with theta n zero. Mm -hmm. That means that theta m times theta n, that's not going to be zero. But on the other hand, theta m squared is going to be zero for any n. Mm -hmm. The next thing is we can go yet one step further and we can go from theta m where m goes from, say, 0 to 4, we're talking direct language. We go to theta m of x, of Grassmann field, and then we'll, we'll be saying theta m of x, theta n of, let's say, y. Well, it's zero. All right. And let's see. Over here, I guess I skipped this. I used it. Right, I used it, but I never. Oh, yeah, I did tell you. I said we had psi, psi dagger is one, but psi squared and psi dagger squared is zero. 
Well, what we were doing was mimicking the Dirac field for the case of uh, a single variable. And so here we can say psi m of x and t. Let me just remind you then of the Dirac commutation, anti commutation relation. Delta mn, delta q, x minus x prime, spatial variable. On the other hand, psi m of x, well, x and t actually. These are equal time and the commutation. And then psi dagger m. Okay, so those are just the Dirac field anti-commutation relations. And now our zero state is going to be defined as a product over M and X of psi M of X spatial and T, some arbitrary state G. And then we're going to define a state theta as exp sum on m integral psi dagger m of x and t theta m of x d, wow, what about the d, whatever. This better be d cubed x. And um, zero. Just as over here. Oh, I, I forgot to say that. The state theta, what is it? It's one plus theta dagger, psi dagger theta. But we can equally write theta as e to the psi dagger theta on zero. Because when we expand this, we only get two terms. And what we have then is that this state theta is an eigenstate of the Dirac field operator at time. So this is the analog of what we had was phi of um, x and t phi is, say, phi prime, I always call it. I don't know, I think that probably was a mistake, but anyway. So it's an analog of the position eigenstates. All right. Well, we're over time. Um, that's enough for now, for sure. Uh, is that x? supposed to be there? The pi that you're multiplying? I mean, under the pi. This is supposed to be. Not here. the very, the top. The pi mx. I'm sorry, the multiplication. What do you call that multiplication? Product. It's supposed to be product. here. About the product. Where else are we? Saying about the product at top. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What does that mean? I mean, you're just for every. We're process. multiplying those annihilation operators. The reason we want this, let's suppose there were only two. In other words, for, for just two Fermi degrees of freedom, yes, maybe X. Yeah. it would be psi 1, psi 2, any state G. He's asking that's about the, the M's. M's. That's the M's, though, right? He's asking about the X label on the product. Well, X, M, who cares? It's just another, very, it's another label. But I mean, M is a discrete number, and X yeah, is yeah, a continuous yeah. thing. But yeah, but on the lattice, the, that's, that's true. Are we on a lattice implicitly no. here? <laughs> <laughs> but all right. anyway, why it's the product? It's the product because what we want is we want psi 1 to be 0 and psi 2 to be 0. If we didn't have a product, but, I mean, you we, had, we had a sum or something, it wouldn't work. I think the question is why are we taking the product over all x? Because we want, we want 
Because there's also a psi yeah. of m x t on this to give us zero for all x. Yeah. Good question. All right. I, I, is that, is I don't that, know who won, who gets the chocolate, but. Is that a sensible thing to do, though? Because x is a continuous variable, right? How can you multiply yeah. just an infinite No, hell, I mean, you can do a pattern of Nothing should surprise you at this point. <laughs> 